Uh, I'd like to address some passages which help support the biblical teaching that Christians are never to receive payment in exchange for them exercising their spiritual gifts. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 8, we have Christ giving some instructions to his disciples uh, in regard to their ministry. In verse 8 we read, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without pain, give without pay. I note the prohibition Christ gives to his disciples in verse 8 in regards to all the ministry that they would engage in. He tells them, you received without pain, give without pay. He is thus instructing them to engage in all their spiritual labors for free, without pay. No exception. Now, some might argue that this prohibition was only temporary. It was only for the disciples at this time, or it was only when they were going to uh, preach to the Jews. However, one of the reasons why we know Christ's prohibition wasn't temporary, was, but it was permanent, was because his basis for the prohibition was a spiritual reality that was true back then and would remain permanent throughout the history of the church up until this very day. When Christ says to the disciples, you receive without pay, he's likely referring to the reality of how they had received all their spiritual understanding and their abilities, their spiritual gifts from God without paying for them. Disciples never had to earn these gifts. They never had to work for them or pay money to the Holy Spirit for them, whether it be their gifts of preaching, healing, the ability to cast out demons. They received all these things from God for free. And that is the reason why they were never to receive pay from people whenever they ministered to them using their gifts. It is because they had received those very same sacred gifts from God without paying for them. It appears in the mind of Christ it would have been incongruous and inappropriate for them to make money by means of using all these wonderful gifts that God had given to them for free. We see that Christ bases his prohibition not on something cultural or temporary, but upon a permanent spiritual reality, a reality that was true back then and would be true up until this very day, for it is still very true that we as Christians have received our spiritual understanding and gifts without paying for them. And so even as this prohibition was binding upon the disciples during Christ's time because they had received their gifts for free, it would stand to reason that the very same prohibition would be binding on us as well, for we have received our gifts for free. Now I realize many Christians will respond by citing 1 Corinthians 9 or 1 Timothy 5 to support some kind of paid ministry, but those passages, when properly understood, don't really provide a sound basis at all for someone receiving financial compensation for any spiritual labor they engage in. Now, I've dealt with uh, these passages in depth in two separate videos, which I have links to in the description section below. And so rather than repeat um, the arguments I give in those videos, I would encourage you to watch those videos if you're interested in learning my views on those texts. Uh, if not, you're welcome to ask questions in the comments section below where I'll be willing to dialogue with you about them. In further support of the fact that Christians are not to receive money for any ministry they do, consider the fact that in every single account in the New Testament that deals with the exchange of money for the use or purchase of a spiritual gift, it is never put in a positive light. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, Paul says, For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. The word peddling basically means to be a retailer. Someone who makes money by selling something. So Paul is indicating that he did not teach the word of God to make money. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, Peter says in regard to false teachers, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Among other things, we see that these false teachers are condemned for seeking to teach in order to basically get money out of people. In addition, there is the account in Acts chapter 8 where a man named Simon tries to buy a spiritual gift from Peter. Consider Peter's response in Acts chapter 8, verse 20. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Peter's response was for him to go die along with his money. He seemed to be pronouncing death on this man for the sin of thinking he could pay money for a spiritual gift. Lastly, in John chapter 10, verse 11 through 12, Christ asserts that he is the good shepherd, one who gives his life for the sheep. In other words, one of the main ways a good shepherd proves he is good is through his sacrifice for the sheep. But Christ contrasts himself with a person who is a hired shepherd, someone who makes money for his shepherding. Christ declares that 
when the wolf comes, he flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Once again, we see that people who engage in spiritual service for money are not put in a good light at all. Now, the application of Christ's prohibition and everything else I have said is hopefully obvious. And that is, Christians should never receive payment in exchange for their use of their spiritual gifts. Those of you who are believers, please remember that any spiritual gifts you have were given to you freely by the grace of God. Those gifts combined with your personality are to be your unique way of communicating Christ's love to others by ministering to their various needs. But note that such ministry to be most pleasing to Christ should be done out of sacrificial love where you expect nothing in return. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul makes it clear that love is central and vital to making the use of our spiritual gifts pleasing to God. For example, in verse 1 he says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And one of the characteristics of true love is that it is not self-seeking, it is selfless. This would certainly imply that Paul didn't want Christians using their spiritual gifts as a means of making money. For doing things out of love and for money are, are generally mutually exclusive. Assume you asked me to spend a couple of hours helping you move out of your current house or apartment. And I respond by saying, well, certainly I would be happy to help you out. I enjoy doing things for my loved ones, even if it means you know, sacrificing some of my time. But I just ask that you pay me $15 an hour to compensate me for my labors. Now, how would you feel about that? I think you would realize that the fact that I'm asking for money would tend to conflict with my claim that I'm doing this favor as a sacrifice. Because if I'm hoping and asking for money from you for what I'm doing, the implication is that I'm not really interested in serving you solely because I love you and want to help you, but instead it is partly to get something from you. That is, I'm not really willing to sacrifice all my time for your benefit. That is not really love. As another example, the work that I do at my job is, is not really done out of love from my employer. Now, I can try to be Christ-like in the office and try to be a good employee in the eyes of God, but the actual labor I'm doing is not technically an act of love to my employer because I'm getting paid for it. And I do it on condition of getting paid. That is not really sacrificial love. Earning money and, and sacrificial love don't generally go together. Again, when it comes to using our spiritual gifts, love is of vital central importance in the eyes of God. And this is another reason not to seek payment for your spiritual labors. Because when you do so, you are tarnishing the quality of your work in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. And I believe as a result of you seeking such rewards in this life of your work, you, will, you seriously risk losing out on receiving rewards for your work in the life to come, which Christ promises to his faithful servants. Note that I realize that many Christians who receive money for their spiritual work, whether it be the work they do in church or even on YouTube, uh, they will often use euphemisms in regard to the payment they receive. They will often talk about receiving donations or love offerings, uh, receiving support for their ministry, for God's kingdom work. Now they can use all the spiritual loving terminology they want. The fact is they are receiving payment for what they are doing, which violates Christ's prohibition. Now one of the common objections to this idea that Christians are never to receive money for their labors is that they will cite how pastors often have so many responsibilities to their church and that such pastors need to be paid a salary in some form as they can't possibly hold a full-time or even a part-time job. They might assert how their pastor spends 30 to 40 hours a week preparing sermons, maybe visiting the sick, doing counseling, and so forth. And yes, I would agree that if he is responsible to do all these things, it would be highly unlikely he could hold a regular job. However, the problem with this argument is that nowhere in the Bible does God give a pastor such responsibilities to the point that it should take up such a massive amount of his time during the week. Church tradition may have assigned all these responsibilities to a pastor, but the Bible does not. The New Testament instructs elders to shepherd the flock, which would entail counseling and teaching at times, and they are to protect the flock from false teachers and so forth. But they are never charged with all the various responsibilities that the typical pastor uh, feels he, might, he must fulfill today. Now, one of the reasons we know this is because elders are instructed to work with their own hands to support themselves, as Paul teaches in Acts chapter 20. That is, they were to have regular jobs like everyone else. 
obviously if Paul expected elders to have normal jobs that would require a lot of their time and energy, it is highly doubtful he would also charge them with all the various church responsibilities pastors often have today that would make holding a full-time job nearly impossible. Furthermore, the New Testament never requires one man or a few men to do all the work of the ministry. Instead, the New Testament emphasizes that it is the whole body that is to function when the church gathers. And one of the roles of the pastors are simply to help facilitate that, to help train the body to use their gifts. So many of those responsibilities that Christians assert their pastor has are really in the eyes of God to be shared and handled by the rest of the body according to their gifts. There's no need for one man or a few men to do all the majority of the ministry. For example, nowhere in the, in the entire New Testament does it command a pastor, pastor to preach a 30 to 40 minute sermon each week where everyone uh, has to largely sit in silence and listen. This is a tradition of men and a destructive one at that as it can tend to take up so much time that it can tend to limit the amount of time other people can contribute to the meeting. The New Testament models for the whole body to be free to use their gifts in an orderly way according to how they are led and gifted by the Holy Spirit. And when a church follows such a biblical model like this, it is quite easy for all the members, including the pastors, to hold regular full-time jobs. It is only when you have a very flawed, unbiblical approach to church life that God never endorses, that contributes to a situation where a pastor has so many responsibilities that he can't handle a full-time job. Now this brings me to another objection I hear on occasion, and that is Christians will sometimes claim that God at times calls people to full-time ministry, and I have no business questioning such a call. Now, ironically, when I was in my 20s, I had uh, done some teaching, and I was heavily into studying theology, and I had begun to have a strong feeling that I was being called to full-time ministry. I thought that one day I would eventually leave my job and become a pastor where I would end up being supported by a church, ultimately getting paid for my labor. However, that belief and strong feeling I had were not of God. Now, the desire and ability to teach and minister was of God because such a desire and ability harmonizes with biblical principles. But what was not of God was the idea that I would leave my current job and become a full-time pastor, where I would no longer be supporting myself through a legitimate trade, but but end up basically receiving payment from a church for teaching and serving. We know that is not of God because such an idea conflicts with the Bible. I'm clearly instructed to work to earn a living. I'm forbidden from receiving any payment for the exercise of my spiritual gifts. Now, thankfully, since then, I've repented of my corrupt views of church and ministry. But my, my point is that I fully understand from my, my own experience something of this supposed call to full-time ministry. But what we must remind ourselves of is that any supposed call a person has to the ministry must be scrutinized under the lens of the Bible. That is the final authority, not my feelings and not your feelings, about any work we might think God wants us to do in this life. Now, I want to emphasize on a more positive note that all of you who are Christians should be thankful to God that he has given you your spiritual gifts for free. And you should be excited to use those abilities for free and feel privileged that you can be a means of Christ communicating his love and care to others freely. Especially in our day when there are so many Christians and, and non-Christians that have such a bad taste in their mouth from all the corruption among church leaders connected to money. You have an opportunity to shine as one of those rare Christians who is willing and ready to give of themselves to minister to others and not be seeking anything in return. You have an opportunity to be like Paul who saw himself as a slave of Christ which, among other things, implied he would not get paid for his work. Paul gave himself to the ministry solely to please Christ and to minister to others out of love for them, not expecting or hoping to receive anything from them. Consider 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, where Paul seeks to convey something of his sacrificial, fatherly love to the Corinthians. As he says, For I seek not what is yours, but you. Paul is impressing upon the Corinthians how he labored among them, not because he hoped to get something from them, like money. Instead, he simply desired them. That is, he desired their spiritual well-being. He desired them to mature and grow more and more into the image of Christ. To borrow an analogy someone once used in regard to the ministry, consider the candle. The candle doesn't generate light in order to grow in size. Instead, it expends itself, ultimately getting smaller in size as it generates light. 
so ought we to be as a candle in regard to any ministry we engage in. We don't minister in order to grow in size in terms of our bank accounts or our popularity. Instead, we are to be willing to expend ourselves, allowing ourselves to melt away, so to speak, in order to generate spiritual light. Being willing to burn up a lot of our energy and personal time as we use our spiritual gifts and sacrificial service to others, expecting and hoping for no monetary reward in return. The only rewards we should be looking for are those that will be given by Christ to his faithful servants when we stand before him in judgment. Thank you, and may our Heavenly Father bless you.